Uh, Salam alaikum. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, Cadex AJ Academic Activity today, uh, 2nd of June, 2022. Um, today, uh, we have uh, on the agenda, we have Dr. Uh, Muhammad Al Mutlak, who is going to present cardiac tumors. And then we'll be followed by pericardial diseases for, uh, by Dr. Asuha Athabate. Uh, and then uh, the last uh, topic would be total pericardiectomy surgical technique and outcomes by Dr. Ahmed Al Ghamdi. We have a guest consultant, Dr. Ibrahim Al Abdullah from uh, King Faisal Specialist Hospital, uh, Riyadh. Uh, panel uh, is me and Dr. Abdullah Al Hadib. Uh, Dr. Mohammed, uh, whenever you are ready. You want to stop now? You hear me now? Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. My name is Dr. Muhammad al Today, inshallah, I will uh, talk about cardiac tumor. So, cardiac tumor are the mostly an incidental finding. Primary tumor of the heart are rare. Secondary cardiac tumor are 30 times more common. The incidence is between 7.7 to 3.5% in general population. Primary cardiac tumor, benign, more than 80%, and malignant less than 20, cardiac myxoma constitute half of them. Metastatic tumor, the incidence between 1.7 to 14, average 7.1 in cancer patient. General population, average incidence 2.3. Cardiac metastasis can occur either by direct extension, blood stream, and lymphatic. Pericardial metastasis, about 69%. Epicardial, 34, 34, myocardial, 32. Endocardial, 5%. Benign, like myxoma, rhabdomyoma, fibroma, malignant, like sarcoma and lymphoma. Metastasis from renal cell carcinoma, melanoma, breast cancer, and lung cancer. Epidemiology. The types of tumor predominantly seen in adults are different from that seen in children. 85 of benign tumor in adults are myxoma, libomatous tumor, and babylary fibroelastoma. 80% of benign tumor in children are rhabdomyoma, teratoma, and fibroma. Incidence of benign tumor, myxoma 42 in 46 in adult. Rhabdomyoma 46 in children and infant. For malignant, angiosarcoma 33% in adult. Rhabdomyosarcoma 66 in infant and 44 the malignant teratoma. Clinical manifestation, the clinical manifestation can be divided into four general me mechanistic category. Systemic manifestation, embolic manifestation, cardiac manifestation, phenomena secondary to metastasic disease. So constitutional symptom like fever, fatigue, and malaise. Lab finding, leukocytosis, polycythemia, anemia, thrombocytosis. These systemic manifestations are believed to be produced by secretory product, released by tumor, or by tumor necrosis like interleukin-6. Most common seen in cardiac myxoma. Embolic phenomena can be systemic or pulmonary embolism. Tumor emboli or thromboemboli from tumor surface. The tendency to embolize depends on the origin of the tumor or type of tumor or associated, like left ventricle dystrophy function or thrombophilic status. Most commonly seen in cardiac myxomas, especially with villous surface. The brain is the most common site of emboli. Brain emboli most common cause of TIA or ischemic stroke, but rarely intracerebral hemorrhage can be presented. Coronary artery embolism can be seen rarely as mimic MI. Pulmonary embolism embolization is also rare, more with right side tumor and left side tumor in the presence of intracardiac L2R shunt. Mechanism direct mechanical interference with the myocardial or valvular function, interruption of coronary blood flow, or interference with the electrophysiology conduction, pericardial effusion. Metastatic disease, truly metastatic disease, are by definition features of malignant primary cardiac tumor. 
common site of metastasis lung, brain, and bone, often metastasis to the liver, lymph node, and adrenal gland. Diagnostic approach for diagnosis, high index of suspicion is needed. When the cardiac tumor is considered in the differential diagnosis, echocardiography, TE or TI, TTE, has, be, has to be taken. TE is better due to proximal to the heart, no interference with the lung and bone, high frequency. Just CT with the contrast enhancement and cardiac MRI with contrast are superior modality for, de, for delineation of the extent of the tumor. Features suggestive of malignant cardiac tumor. Large broad based legion occupy most of the affected cardiac chamber. Higher lymphadenopathy extends to the pericardial involvement, hemorrhagic of the pericardial effusion. For the for definite diagnosed histopathology is mandatory. Less invasive method, such as cytology, cytological evaluation of pericardial or pleural fluid, might help in the diagnosis in some cases only. BET scan useful in the metastatic workup. Coronary angiogram may be needed before surgery to know the feeding vessels to the mass. More invasive method of the tumor biopsy through intravenous route or metastinoscopy or even through thoracotomy may be necessary to obtain a definitive diagnosis. Benign tumors. First one, myxomas. Most common type of the primary cardiac tumor is myxoma, more than 50% of all primary tumors. Most commonly present in the adult between 3, 30 to 50 years. About 65 seen in the woman, arising from multipotent mesenchymal cell. 5 to 10 percent myxoma are familiar. Hallmark of histopathology, histological feature is myxoma cell or lipidic cell. Myxoma cell can produce vascular endothelial growth factor and interleukin 6. This is the lipidic cell. So majority of the patient with the myxoma will present with at least one of the classic triad, obstructive cardiac and embolic and constitutional or systemic symptom. Obstructive symptom like dizziness, dyspnea, cough, and pulmonary edema. On physical examination, LA is involving with the myxoma, loud S1, and sometimes S1 splitting occur. Whole systolic murmur, midday systolic murmur with turbulent blood flow through the mitral orifice, sign of pulmonary congestion, tumor blood, a sudden bolus of the blood, a blast tumor, protruding into ventricle cause a third sound. Is it transient and positional? RA myxoma, finding of rapidly progressive right side heart failure. Seen with the fatigue, peripheral edema, ascites, the, the, the diagnosis is often delayed. Obstructive cardiac findings are due to the mechanical interference with the mitral valve by the tumor. Tumor embolism, most common cardiac tumor is embolized, virtually to the every organ, most to the CNS. Symptoms depend on the location of the tumor and the potency of the foramen ova. Investigation, ECG may show LA enlargement. Arterial erythemia and conduction is disorder are rare. Chest X-ray show evidence of elevated LA pressure, such as LA enlargement, vascular redistribution, prominent pulmonary trunk and pulmonary edema. Intracardiac calcification is rare in the LA myxoma, but it is seen most of the case with RA myxoma. Echocardiography is the most common used modality for diagnosis purpose, and TEE is the preferred echo modality. Most common, most of cardiac myxoma appear as spherical or ovoid mass with lobular contour on CT and cardiac MRI. CT with contrast revealed the most myxoma heart and overall attenuation lower than that of myocardium. On CT, two thirds of myxoma are heterogeneous, where the one third homogeneous. 83 in LA and 12 occur in RA and 1.3 are bilateral. Only 1.7 and 0.6 of myxoma occur in LV and RV respectively. Usually, bidinoculated tumor with fibrovascular stuck attached to the subendothelial base of intra-arterial septum in the region of the fossa ovalis. Rarely cardiac myxoma can involve heart valves directly. So this is by TE. Size usually between four to six to eight. 
in diameter with the maximum report as 16. Half of cardiac myxoma have smooth compact surface with half have villous surface. Myxoma with the villous surface are more likely to embolize. Cani syndrome is autosomal dominant syndrome. Myxoma is in the, in the cardiac and several extracardiac locations. Spot skin pigmentation, endocardial, endocard, endocrine, hyperactivity, other tumor, there is other tumor like pituitary tumor and thyroid tumor. Carney syndrome is no age or gender association, but in the sporadic cardiac myxoma, more with the women. Single or multiple tumor, any intracardiac location, the recurrence rate between 20 percent, despite adequate surgical excision. In the sporadic cardiac myxoma, isolated lesion most common in the left atrium aspect of intraarterial septum. Lower recurrence. Treatment, the treatment is need to surgical resection. Complete excision is a goal, although this, this may not be possible in an instance. Post operative mortality in the most serious range from 0 to 7.5. Recurrence 3%. Lipomatous tumor. Lipomatous tumor is a benign tumor, is the second most common primary benign tumor. It can be divided into major groups on the basis of the degree of encapsulation, like a liboma, lipomatous hypertrophy of atrial septum. So first one, liboma. Liboma is sporadic with equal occurrence in both gender, clinically most asymptomatic, and typically incidental finding, can occur at any arterial or ventricular surface, most common in sub-epicardial sub and sub-endocardial location. Also, intramyocardial lesion have also been reported. Sub-endocardial sub lipoma with prominent intracavitary component can be result in symptom of the heart failure. Sub-epicardial tumor are usually asymptomatic, but large lesion may be cause compression of the heart and produce epicardial effusion. Intramyocardial lipoma may be interferes with the ectical conduction in the heart and cause arrhythmia. TE followed by CT is the modality of choice as the display of Low attenuation, simply low attenuation signal, similar to subcontinuous or mediastinal pack. Size typically range from one to eight centimeter in diameter. The treatment of symptomatic cardiac tibomas, the surgical resection, and the post operative prognosis is excellent. And we here see a hyper, hyper quick mass with the broad base adherent to the, to the uh, intraventricular septum. And we see here intraoperative imaging lipoma in the right ventricular incision. The other one, lipomatous hypertrophy. Lipomatous hypertrophy is a massive fatty deposition of the arterial septum. In the non it is non encapsulated excessive accumulation of the fat in the arterial septum. So it is excessive accumulation of the fat in the arterial septum at level of the fossa ovalis. It is more than two centimeter in thickening in thickness and typically occur in the elderly, obese patient also. Mean age diagnosed 70 years. Clinically, does not usually cause any symptom, but it at times result in arrhythmia, disturbance, and even sudden cardiac arrest. The fatty tissue infiltration into arterial myocyte tissue can change the architecture of the function. At the function of the myocyte, rarely the tumor protrudes into the right atrium and the superior vena cava and can be present with the symptom related to the blood flow obstruction. CT and cardiac MRI are the most desirable than echo. Arterial septum is the thickened up to seven centimeter, whereas the normally it's less than one centimeter. But this thickening always avoid the fossa ovalis, giving the arterial septum like a dumbbell shape or hourglass shape. With the symptomatic arrhythmia can be managed medically. Surgical management should be restricted to the hemodynamic compromised patient. So this is dumbbell shape for lipomatous hypertrophy. The other one, fibro, uh, the other one, babillary fibroelastoma. Babillary fibroelastoma is the third most common primary cardiac tumor. Fibroblastic, fibroelastic growth does not spontaneously regress which may have focal calcification. 
clinically most asymptomatic. This under uh, microscope. A serious showed 50% of the patient had TIA, stroke, angina, and myocardial infarction, and sepnia. Cerebral embolic symptoms are present more than 50% of the symptomatic patient. Rarely, patient present with the infective endocarditis and BE, and sudden cardiac arrest. Firmly attached to the valvular or mural, or mural endocardia. TE is the recommended imaging modality for the diagnosis for the lesion, measure two centimeter or more. Generally appear as the round, oval, or a regular region. 80 to 90 found in the valvular endocardia. Most common in the aortic valve. Around 40% of babular, babillary fibroelastoma have one to three millimeter stack. This mobile type appear more likely to give, to give rise to embolism. The treatment surgical excision or tumor shaping from the valvular leaflet with either reconstruction or replacement of the valve. A symptomatic patient with a small left-sided non-mobile type can be observed. Tumor more than one centimeter mobile, left side symptomatic, are need to excision. Rhabdomyoma. Most frequent, rhabdomyoma is more most frequent primary cardiac tumor in infant and children. 80% less than one year, but adult present are also seen while rare. Childhood rhabdomyoma regress in most the case, it's believed to be due to high expression of ubiquitin protein in this tumor from 34 week onward. In about 80 to, 9, to 90 of the patient is associated with the tuberous sclerosis. 70% arterial origin, and 30 in ventricular. Arrhythmia represent of the most common representation in adults. Anti-arrhythmia drug may be used. Surgical excision is indicated if the drug failed to control symptom. No recurrence. Prognosis of this disease is excellent. And this is the histopathology for this spider cell. What's, and spider cell is a characteristic of regression of rhabdomyoma. And here, we, as we see, uh, cardiac MRI, localized mass in the interventricular ventricular septum with that extend from the level of the aortic valve toward the mid cavity. Fibromas. Fibroma, cardiac fibroma, second most common primary cardiac tumor in infant and children. 90% in children, less than one year. No sex association. Majority appear to be non-familial. Majority of the cardiac fibroma are no tendency to recur or to grow aggressively. Do not regress as rhabdomyoma. Heart failure due to the mechanical obstruction is the most common symptom. Can cause arrhythmogenic disorder like a VTAC or arterial fibrillation and, and bundle branch blocker. Also cause myocardial dysfunction. Third of the patient with the cardiac fibroma can remain asymptomatic. The average size of the tumor, five centimeters. Generally, single lesion, commonly found in left ventricle septum, or LV free wall. Occurrence in right ventricle or arterial is less than 10%. Fibroma ECG may show evidence of LV hypertrophy, RV hypertrophy, bundle branch blocker. Chest X ray reveal cardiomegaly with or without focal blood and calcification is visible in 15 of the cases. An echo cardiac fibroma usually appear as solitary homogeneous echogenic lesion. In CT, cardiac MRI are more desirable for evaluating the restricted ability of the region. The differential feature of the favoring fibroma over rhabdomyoma is calcification, which occur in fibroma but not in rhabdomyoma. Complete surgical resection in symptomatic case is recommended. Both operative prognosis, good. For large and resectable tumor, cardiac transplantation may be considered. Teratoma. Second most common cardiac tumor in infant. Usually arising from pericardium, generally benign, but can cause obstruction symptom and hydropetalis in, in utero. Can cause cardiac tamponade also immediately. Surgical excision can be curative. Recurrence is rare. Birkin cell tumor. Multifocal. The Birkin cell tumor is multifocal Birkin cell tumor of the heart. It's rare. One of the cause of the sudden death 
due to intractable beta uh, consists of a small sheet of the cell, most common location in LV, cannot be localized by ECO and the radiological means. Electrophysiology study may be needed to localize the tumors. Surgical removal is curative. Hem hematoma and paraganglionoma. Cardiac hematoma are also present with tachyarrhythmia, usually single, localized by ECO and most common site ventricle. Paraganglioma can hormonally active and inactive. Norepinephrine secreting paraganglioma may produce headache, palpitation, sweating, eye have, and hypertension. Pericardium is the most common site, can be localized by ECO, highly vascular tumor, hence difficult to excise sometimes if it is hormoning, if it is hormone secreting also. Primary vascular tumor, hemangioma, lymphangioma, and hemangioendothelioma. Extremely rare, benign with tendency to recur, no age or gender association, usually asymptomatic, but can present with the palpitation, arrhythmia, and heart, and heart failure and pericardial effusion. ECO is sensitive and non invasive method for detection the tumor with the cardiac hemangioma, appearing to be typically as hyper echoic lesion. Tumor blush typically seen in the coronary and geography. Ventricle more than atrium. Treatment is surgical resection or embolization. Malignant tumor, fifth of primary cardiac tumor are malignant, less than 20%. Most of them are sarcoma, followed by lymphoma. Metastatic tumor are 30 times more common than primary malignant tumor. Mostly metastasized come from the lung and breast cancer. Hodging disease, malignant melanoma, numerous primary gastrointestinal malignant neoplasm, adrenal cell carcinoma. Common malignant primary cardiac tumor, angiosarcoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, leiomyosarcoma, fibrosarcoma, malignant lymphoma, and mesothelioma. Sarcomas have a worse prognosis if shows high mitotic activity, mitotic activity, extensive tumor necrosis. Poor cellular differentiation, the process of the metastasis. Cardiac MRI is usually the method of choice for imaging of sarcomas. On CT and cardiac MRI, large heterogeneous broad based masses that frequently occupy most of the affected cardiac chamber. Extension into the cardiac chamber, pericardium with the fusion may be seen. Hyaluronic lymphadenopathy can also occur. Angiosarcoma. More angiosarcoma is the most common primary cardiac sarcoma in adults, 30 to 50 years old. Slightly more common in male, occupies vertically. 65 to 90 of the patient are diagnosed have evidence of metastatic disease. 90% of RA, MRA, and involvement of structure, such as tricuspid valve, pulmonary valve, and vena cava, as well as extension through pericardia. ECG reveals non specificity change, arrhythmia, and AV block. Chest X ray may show non specific change, like cardiomegaly, wedding mediastinum, higher lymphadenopathy, pleural effusion. He is essential imaging modality of choice. On CT and cardiac MRI, appear as a low attenuation in invasive, irregular nodular masses showed heterogeneous enhancement with the frequent pericardial involvement and hemorrhagic pericardial effusion may be seen. Immunohisto, immunohistochemical analysis is done for final diagnosis. It is aggressive neoplasm with the poor prognosis as mean survival nine to 10 months. Common site of metastasis, lung, liver, brain, and bone. Multidisciplinary approach to the treatment of cardiac angiosarcoma is advocated including combination surgery, Radiation, adjuvant, neuroadjuvant, chemotherapy, surgery, complete tumor resection if possible. Rhabdomyosarcoma. Rhabdomyosarcoma, most common primary sarcoma of the heart in children, usually in the second decade of the life, with slightly more common in male. Heart failure, arrhythmia, cardiac murmur, and constitutional symptoms are common manifestation of this disease. Occasionally, cases are also associated with the hyper, xenophilia hypertrophic 
osteoarthropathy and polyarthritis. Echo followed by cardiac MRI and CT to delineate the extent of the tumor. In contrast to angiosarcoma, cardiac rhabdomyosarcoma show no association for the specific cavity. And multiple lesions are frequently present. Aggressive neoplasm with the tendency to metastasis most commonly to the lung and lymph node will survive less than one year. The primary aim for the treatment to complete surgical resection, poor response to radiotherapy and chemotherapy. In selected case, heart transplant may be considered if no obvious distance, metastasis are present. Leiomyosarcoma. Leiomyosarcoma type of malignant mesenchymal tumor with the smooth muscle differentiation. Mean age, 4 dK, and there is no apparent sex association. The common clinical presentation include dyspnea, pericardial effusion, chest pain, arterial arrhythmia, and heart failure, 70 to 80, arising from left atrium. And they tend to extend into pulmonary trunk. Eco followed by CT cardiac MRI for diagnosis. Rapidly growing tumor with high rate of local recurrence and distance metastasis. Prognosis is poor with mean survival six months. Lymphoma. One, lymphoma is 1.3 to 2 percent of all primary cardiac tumor. Seen in both immunocompetent and immunocompromised. Commonly associated with HIV and the transplant lymphoproliferative disorder and EBV virus infection. The average age for lymphoma, 62 to 67 with male, predominantly. The common clinical presentation for lymphoma include chest pain, heart failure, pericardial fusion, palpitation. Less common presentation are cardiac tumbinal, pulmonary and systemic embolism. ECG finding, non-specific. For diagnosed echo, echo followed by CT and cardiac MRI. Right side involvement more common in lymphoma. Size range from three to 12 centimeter in size with the mean seven centimeter. Treatment, early implant, implant, implementation for anthrocycline and rituximab based chemotherapy with or without radiation therapy has become the mainstay treatment for, for primary cardiac lymphoma. 60% of the patient died of the disease within two months after the initial diagnosis. Secondary cardiac tumor incidence between 1.7 to 14 in the cancer patients. Cardiac metastasis can occur either by direct extension through the blood or through the bloodstream or through lymphatics. Pericardial metastasis, 69%, followed by epicardial, 34 myocardial to metastasis 32, and endocardial, 5%. The pericardium is the most often involved because the direct invasion by thoracic cancer, including the breast or lung cancer. Abdominal and pelvic tumor may be reached to the right atrium through IBC, the most common tumor exhibiting this tendency in the renal cell cancer. In male, lung cancer, followed by esophageal cancer and lymphoma. In female, lung cancer followed by lymphoma and breast cancer. Clinical manifestation, peripheral edema is the common clinical manifestation for the secondary cardiac tumor. Heart failure, cardiac arrhythmia, heart block, acute myocardial infarction, systemic embolization, superior vena cava syndrome. Secondary cardiac tumor are associated with a poor prognosis. This research characteristic and survival of the management of cardiac tumor. The conclusion, conclusion for this research, the most common cardiac primary tumor is sarcoma. Primary malignant cardiac tumor is sarcoma, 64%, followed by lymphoma, 27%, mesothelioma, 80%. After a median followed of 18 months, more than 85 patients died. The survival rate for, for one, three, and five years were 50, 24, and 19. For, for 2000 to 2011. Primary malignant cardiac tumor are extremely rare and continue to be associated with the poor prognosis over the past five decades. The incidence and survival of the patient diagnosed with the primary malignant cardiac tumor appear to have increased compared with the worst with the extra cardiac cancer or of the similar histopathology patient with the primary malignant cardiac tumor 
are often younger and worse survival. The other research survival after resection of the primary cardiac tumor, the conclusion the, for this research, cardiac tumor can be resected with minimal morbidity and mortality. Then to, the strongest predictor of mortality are closely linked to the tumor histopathology, association with the symptom and duration of carbon monoxide. Patients with the cardiac myxoma, the most common cardiac tumor, and no significant difference for survival than that of standard population. Myxoma patient after resection should be closely followed up with echocardiogram for minimum four years to evaluate for tumor recurrence, especially in the younger patient, whereas the majority of the benign tumor have excellent survival. Patients with the malignant tumor have poor prognosis. And younger patients with the malignant tumor with the have poor survival characteristics. Thank you. Any question? Thank you very much, Dr. Mutlak. Uh, that's very nice and extensive uh, review on the topic of cardiac tumors. Um, uh, just uh, a point. Uh, some, I remember looking at a, uh, the technique of cardiac autotransplantation for a section of extensive cardiac tumors, uh, which involving the left side. As you know, some malignant cardiac tumor, when to be uh, resected, needs to uh, have good margins uh, of resection. So what they, I think it uh, was, uh, described in uh, Methodist, uh, uh, the Baker Institute. So what they do is actually they resect the uh, they uh, take the heart out as as you do in um, heart transplant, uh, and uh, they remove the whole tumor, which is at the back of the in case it's in the left atrium or involving the left uh, uh, around that area. So you will have better exposure when you take it out and you will have better resection. And then you remove all of it and you reconstruct the left uh, atrium and then you re-implant uh, uh, the heart. Uh, so that's one um, unusual technique uh, that can be used with, with an excellent result as they reported. Uh, the other point about the, uh, the one you mentioned, embolization of the myxomas. Uh, to the coronary circulation. I wonder if any embolization, how that will be retrieved. Uh, I wonder if the intervention cardiologist will be able to uh, to retrieve uh, such embolization from the myxoma. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Victor? No, from my side, I didn't see, and I haven't seen only by research and read about something this. I think it's need uh, yeah, handy training more than, and the more experience, but Dr. maybe Dr. Ibrahim, uh, consultant Dr. Ibrahim Abdullah can give some offer for this issue. Yes, welcome Dr. Ibrahim, uh, happy to have you here. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim is a uh, um, consultant, uh, congenital surgeon, King Faisal uh, Riyad, and he has a, uh, uh, Extensive experience. He he, he was trained in uh, uh, Boston Children's Hospital in the states, and then he had extensive experience after that. Doctor Ibrahim, do you have any comments on the topic, or any of the, uh, or, or any cases you uh, came across with cardiac tumors? Assalamualaikum, Abdullah. Thank you for that uh, that kind introduction. Um, it is it is really a pleasure to be here with all of the uh, cardiac surgical residents, uh, mashallah, in Saudi Arabia. And thank you also for uh, a, a nice uh, presentation, Dr. Al um, so, uh, Al-Mukla. So, first of all, I think alluding to your first um, your first observation, where you mentioned about cardiac autotransplantation, yes, it is a it is a uh, a fascinating approach to some very complex, you know, uh, complex uh, uh, tumors that may be situated in hard to reach locations. In fact, 
I think the one surgeon who was pretty, uh, who was uh, probably had the most experience in this in, in the United States is someone by the name of, I believe, Mike Reardon. I don't know if that's the name. Uh, I, I know he's from Texas. And uh, um, this is what they would quite often do with some of the rare cases that would come from across the country. That's what they would do. They would basically uh, cross clamp, give cardioplegia, remove the heart, go to the back table, remove the tumor, reconstruct whatever they needed to reconstruct, and then reimplant the heart as if you're doing a heart like a transplant. Um, and, and I agree, they, they've reported some, some good results, but uh, from a practical standpoint, I, I think I have not seen that technique applied in a widespread manner. Uh, but, uh, but certainly, you know, it's, it's something to keep in the back of your mind uh, as, a, you know, a, a, a thing that could be a possibility should a patient present with a, a difficult situation with the tumor that's uh, in, a, in a difficult location, uh, that uh, there does exist the expertise, um, whether locally or, 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 or even internationally for such, for such a, an approach. Um, regarding your second question about embolization for, for myxomas, uh, yes, they are prone to embolization. And that's, uh, I think, uh, we'll just backtrack a little bit. Uh, that's why it's important, especially during the, um, the initial, uh, you know, portions of the procedure where, you know, the surgeon is, is going to start the cannulation process, uh, any manipulation of the heart, that has to be kept at a minimum so as to minimize such a risk. Now, if one encounters a, a situation where an embolization occurs in the coronary, although I don't think in the last decade I've, I've seen that happen, but it's certainly conceivable, then I think it, it may be a challenge to know that the coronary has been um, uh, affected unless one tries to come off cardiopulmonary bypass. And, um, and that's where your TE would be, I think, very, very important if it demonstrates any regional wall motion, abnormalities, et cetera. And in that case, um, uh, you know, a, you may not be able to come off cardiopulmonary bypass and you, you may have to, um, you know, resort to, um, uh, to, to ECMO or, or, or something. To, to get, I think what's gonna be important in that situation is to get a, a, an accurate diagno a diagnosis of, of the situation. So um, minimizing the time from the OR to the cath or uh, either the cath lab or even having an intraoperative uh, um, uh, uh, contrast injection to to with with portable fluoro would be uh, something to to consider, uh, especially if you can't come off bypass and uh, you, you know you're dealing with the uh, with the myxoma that uh, uh, Dr. Mutlak mentioned may even have been a sessile one, um, but uh, um, but yes, I, I think in that situation, then the, either the 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 cat I, I can't answer for the uh, cardiologist as to what they can do to try to retrieve an, emb em an, uh, an embolic clot per se, but you may have to be prepared to uh, bypass the segment of, of, the, uh, of the artery that may be obstructed. Thank you, Dr. Brian, uh, for that uh, elaborate uh, answer. Uh, what about and uh, have you came across any uh, cardiac tumors uh, cases uh, in your experience? Uh, and uh, what was it uh, in your practice? Yes, uh, they're rare. I would say in the last uh, uh, ten years, I've, I in, tra in, in my training they were they were more frequent, but uh, in my practice. Uh, 
you know, I could probably count on my fingers the the number of cardiac tumors that uh, you know, came across my you know, my logbook. But um, uh, myxoma has been probably uh, the more frequent one, even in the in the pediatric uh, or young adult range. And for the children, as I, I agree with Dr. I'll uh, look at uh, the um, the uh, cardiac fibro the fibroma seems to be a more common one that I've encountered that has required surgical resection. I do remember one in Arizona where there was basically almost like a the size of a tennis ball on the anterior surface of a two year old's heart. And, um, uh, you know, there was concern whether the coronaries were involved or not. But, uh, you know, one often finds that the fibromas have a, uh, a little bit of a glistening capsule. So what we ended up doing was we basically started to resect or get into the plane between the fibroma and the myocardium. And uh, worked our way, you know, worked our way until we came to the uh, uh, to the region of the uh, of the LAD, and it turned out that the LAD could be peeled off of the uh, the capsule. And uh, actually, I'm sorry, it was not the LAD. It was a right. It was a right coronary, and then it was on the. It, there was a component within the atrium, and it it oversplayed onto the anterior portion of the right ventricle, so it was the right coronary. Um, and uh, it, it it was uh, it, you know it, it came off. My partner in Nebraska, he had one where it was in the in the septum, and that too there was a concern about the conduction system. But uh, you know we're fortunate enough that we were able to peel the fibroma off of the septum with uh, little uh, consequence uh, to the conduction. That's uh, very interesting, uh, Dr. Brahim. Must be a very interesting case and a surgical approach. And um, a, what I've uh, observed here in King Chris, the, the, the training, as you know, that we had a lot of oncological cases in the, in the hospital. The most cases what I've seen deemed inoperable uh, are cases of metastasis or or uh, some mediastinal tumors invading. Uh, I've seen some myxomas, but uh, uh, not really the uh, uh, cardiac origin. Thank you, Dr. Abdullah. And uh, um, um, any, anyone have any other question, comments, or additions from the audience? Okay, so uh, we'll join back, inshallah. After a break of uh, five minutes, uh, 1.55, inshallah, with Dr. Soha uh, on precarious diseases. Thank you. Thank you.
السلام عليكم Good afternoon everyone This is uh, Suat Beit Cardiac Surgery Resident at King Faisal Specialist Hospital and Research Center And today inshallah I'm gonna talk about uh, pericardial diseases Uh, as a review and introduction to the next uh, lecture that will be presented by Dr. Ahmed. So our to talk uh, today is about pericardial diseases. Mainly we will focus on pericarditis and cardiac tamponade. Starting by quick review of anatomy. And uh, as you know that the pericardium, you are looking at the heart. Here's the heart outside the heart and surrounding the great vessels like the aorta and the vena cava, there is this purple covering, which is the pericardium. The pericardium seeing here highlighted in uh, green is a double wall uh, sac that encloses the heart, the pericardial fluid and the root of the great vessels. And it's situated within the middle mediastinum. The pericardium has one layer made up of uh, fibrous tissue and one made of serous tissue. Its function is to lubricate the moving surfaces of the heart. The outer layer of the pericardium is known as the fibrous layer and it consists of dense connective tissue. It's attached to the central tendon of the diaphragm via the a uh, pericardiophrenic ligament whose fibers merge with the tunica adventitia of the vessels which enter and exit the heart. The pericardial sac also attached via ligament fibers to the sternum and due to this attachment, it's affected by the movement of the heart, the great vessels, the sternum and the diaphragm. Uh, this fibrous uh, exterior lining mechanically functioning to uh, prevent or um, yeah, yeah need to, to protect the heart and prevent from uh, overfilling uh, because the fibrous tissue as a whole is resilient and also flexible. It does not stretch that much. And the inner of the pericardium is known as the serous layer or uh, parietal uh, layer, and it's uh, in direct contact with the pericardial fluid. It consists of mesothelial uh, layer that is simple squamous epithelium. And this layer reflects on the root of great vessels, runs directly over the um, external surfaces of the heart as every uh, cardium or visceral, visceral pericardium. The pericardial cavity is the potential space covered by the reflection between the parietal and visceral uh, layers of the serous pericardium. And this is where the thin film of the pericardial fluid is kept, allowing for two surfaces to be lubricated and um, rubs against one another without any friction. Two sinuses exist within the pericardial cavity that include the transverse sinus and the oblique sinus. The transverse pericardial sinus extend transversely across the pericardium and between the roots of the great vessels between the aorta and pulmonary trunk, posterior to the ascending aorta and the pulmonary trunk, and anterior to the superior vena cava as it's shown in this picture. The oblique pericardial sinus exists in posterior part of the pericardium and it's uh, bordered laterally by the pulmonary veins and inferiorly by the inferior vena cava. Uh, and uh, uh, specifically between the right pulmonary veins and inferior vena cava and between the right pulmonary vein and the left pulmonary vein, as it's shown in this picture. The blood supply of the pericardium comes from the pericardiophrenic arteries and internal thoracic artery. And the internal thoracic veins uh, are responsible for the venous drainage of the area. 
Uh, also, the innervation of the pericardium is coming from uh, several branches, including phrenic nerve that gives the sensory fibers that control the pain and sensation and sympathetic chain that's uh, carrying uh, vasomotor uh, fibers. So let's talk about some definitions and disease st states quickly. So when someone is having pericarditis, is obviously the first definition is the inflammation of the visceral layer of the serous pericardium and the pericardial layer of the serous pericardium. And sometimes you can have fluid that accumulates within this pericardial cavity leading to effusion. Now, there is two different types. There is an acute and there is chronic. Sometimes the acute that typically is less than three months and whenever is being involved more equal or more than three months, this is tend to be chronic. So whenever you have inflammation, what happened? When we zoom in, so you can see the myocardium, blood vessels, then, then visceral layer, then blood vessels, parietal layer, also blood vessels, fibrous layer. And when someone has inflammation, that causes a lot of cytokines to be released. These cytokines causes what uh, or causes the blood vessels to uh, become more permeable. So fluid will leak out, start to accumulate in the pericardial cavity, and this will lead to pericardial effusion. And whenever the uh, patient is having pericarditis, most of the time it will lead to pericardial effusion, but you can see also uh, who, who's having pericarditis without effusion. Here's the next thing that we want to talk about, that is the tamponade. So the same concept can occur here, but this uh, in this effusion, whenever there is significant increase in the volume, that uh, pericardium cannot stretch anymore, accommodating that volume and squeezing on the heart, uh, this will decrease the thinness return to the heart that reduces the filling and causing a cardiac output drop. The other thing here is not the uh, increasing in the volume, but rapidly develops. And uh, in this situation, we'll have uh, tamponade. The last state is when you have um, acute pericarditis but it can persist and persist for greater than or equal to three months. And what happens is, you, uh, is that you start to uh, increase the fibrous tissue around that inflammation. Uh, the patient cannot stretch or the pericardium here cannot stretch in case of chronic or recurrent and that will uh, decrease or reduce the ventricular uh, filling very significantly. And this is the constructive pericarditis. So now we have built the foundation of these different pericardial diseases. Coming to the causes of acute pericarditis, most of the time is idiopathic, but it can be uh, divided into major categories. First is the infectious causes, more commonly is the viral, then bacterial, fungal can be uh, there, but it's very rare. Other causes include autoimmune uh, disease, neoplastic, already discussed the cardiac tumors by Dr. Uh, Mohammed before, and he mentioned something about lymphoma and the lung cancers as, metastatic and causing uh, pleural effusion and pericarditis. Could be traumatic or iatrogenic or drug related and other causes. Coming to uh, the last one that if someone have infarction, so no blood flow, no oxygen is getting to this area to the myocardium and the myocardium starts dying and neutrophils and macrophages comes to this area to clean. So in this situation, this will stimulate the cytokines that increases the permeability and inflammation and causing pericarditis. If this happens one to two, three days, uh, 
post MI, this is post MI uh, pericarditis. And if it happens 14 days to months post MI, this is a specific uh, condition called Dressler syndrome, in which the patient will present with persistent low grade fever, pleuritic chest pain, and pericarditis with uh, يعني, examination finding of friction rub on auscultation. And usually it resolves spontaneously. Uh, no need for uh, specific treatment, uh, but uh, anti-inflammatory and say it's steroid colchicine can be used. So uh, for the acute pericarditis, and it has been noticed that in developed countries, most of the causes are iatrogenic, post-traumatic, or following cardiac surgery or intervention. But in developing countries, it's a uh, high prevalence due to uh, tuberculosis, 70 to 80%, and in 90% associated with HIV infection. Coming to the diagnosis, the patient will present with pleuritic chest pain, pericardial friction rub, and diffuse ST, elevation, ST segment elevation on ECG, pericardial effusion. However, you should have at least two of these four main criteria for diagnosis of acute pericarditis. For uh, the diagnostic test or diagnostic evaluation, start by the physical examination, as we have described before, the ECG and TTE, which is the echo, chest X-ray and blood test as a routine or the inflammatory markers such as CRP and ESR. There is a specific finding in acute uh, pericarditis in ECG, and it's divided in two stages. First stage, you will have PR depression and diffuse ST segment elevation. Second stage, which is transitional, J points on the baseline before the T waves begin to flatten, as it's shown in the picture. The third stage, we will have T wave in virgin and it will normalize at the fourth or the last stage. This is another picture. So coming to the management, starting by the medical management. So in case of idiopathic viral or inflammatory pericarditis, you will use ibuprofen and aspirin and colchicine. And in these cases, no need for corticosteroids. The invasive management, you may have, or you may should uh, go for pericardiosynthesis in case of cardiac tamponade, large or symptomatic pericardial effusion, even with the persistent with medical therapy, or highly suspected TB, purulent or neoplastic etiology. This is according to the European uh, guidelines. So, uh, in case of uh, sampling of the pericardial fluid, you may look for protein, LDH, glucose, and cell count. However, these are less useful for diagnosis of specific etiology, but we are looking for distinguish of exudate from transudate uh, pericardial fluid. So other diagnostic model modalities, including the pericardial biopsy, and we may go for the biopsy if the cardiac tamponade relapsed after the pericardiosynthesis, and if the patient without definitive uh, diagnosis who's lasted or his uh, complaint lasted for more than three weeks. And uh, th uh, thoracic and abdominal CT can be used as, diagnosis, as diagnostic modality. So in management of uh, acute uh, or pericarditis, you should even ask, you, ask yourself many questions from the beginning. Uh, is this pericarditis, according to your physical examination, ECG finding, the uh, EQ and the inflammatory markers and the chest X-ray? If it's no, you have, look, uh, you have to look for another differential diagnosis. If it's yes, now you should uh, يعني, classify your patient and uh, look for the etiology. If the patient is high risk, according to what? 
according to the predictors of poor prognosis, which is shown in this corner. If he has high risk uh, with high suspicion of pericarditis, you should admit him and look for the etiology. If not, you can start with empiric uh, anti-inflammatory or NSAIDs. And these cases are non-high risk, but you should even classify them to moderate risk or low risk, because if he's low risk, you can follow them as outpatient. If moderate, you should admit and also check for the uh, underlying pathology. These are the predictors of the poor prognosis. It's divided into major and minor, major including fever, more than 38 subacute onset, large pericardial effusion or tamponade, and there is no response to the aspirin or NSAID after at least one week of therapy. Minor including uh, myopericarditis, immunosuppression, trauma, and patient oral anticoagulant therapy. So according to that, we will have risk stratification. Now, high risk, cases, you will have at least one predictor of this poor prognosis to identify those uh, patients. Cases of moderate risk are the cases without negative prognostic uh, predictors, but there is no complete or lacking response to NSAID therapy. And those with low risk cases who are uh, negative prognostic predictors and good response to anti-inflammatory therapy. So according to the guidelines, the aspirin or NSAIDs are recommended as first line therapy for acute pericarditis with gastroprotection, and this is class one. Colchicine is recommended as first line therapy for acute pericarditis in adjunct to aspirin and NSAID therapy. What about the prognosis? Actually, the most common complication is the recurrence with incidence around 30% and the underlying mechanism thought to be autoimmune. There is uh, a specific category called recurrent pericarditis in which the recurrence of pericarditis after a documented first episode of acute pericarditis and symptom-free interval for four to six weeks or longer. Okay, what should we do with this recurrent pericarditis? Already we have talked about the acute pericarditis. For the recurrent, according to the de definition, first line will go with aspirin or NSAID, colchicine and restriction of exercise. The second line, if there is no response, you may go for low dose corticosteroids. And if there is no response, you may go for immunoglobulin IV, and if it's failed as a medical management, you may need pericardiectomy. So the recommendation for management of recurrent pericarditis as a class um, 1A is aspirin and NSAIDs are mainstay of treatment and are recommended at full doses if tolerated until complete symptom resolution. And colchicine it should be used as um, uh, adjunct to aspirin and insects. Coming to the pericardial effusion. As you can see, ECHO is the gold standard diagnostic uh, modality for uh, these cases in uh, four chamber view, as it's shown large pericardial effusion. The pericardial effusion can be classified according to the onset, size, and distribution, even the composition into transudate and exudate. The large idiopathic chronic pericardial effusion, it's known as, or it's defined as collection of pericardial fluid, persists for than three months and has no uh, clear cause or underlying pathology. And it can be uh, a risk for progression to cardiac tamponade in around 30%. So in these cases, drainage of this large pericardial effusion is recommended after six to eight weeks of treatment. According to the etiology, I got this schedule from Medscape and it's showing main three studies with different etiology, idiopathic neoplasia and neoplasia and uh, infection, connective tissue disease, metabolic disorders. And in two these, these two studies, 
the the adiabatic the infection was the most common causes so coming to the management of pericardial effusion now if you suspect cardiac tamponade or the, the suspected underlying pathology or cause is bacterial or neoplastic etiology, if it's yes, go directly to pericardiosynthesis and search for the etiology. If no, you should check the inflammatory markers. If it's elevated, start the anti-inflammatory therapy and treat it or deal with it as pericarditis. If no, look if the patient is known a uh, case of specific disease or associated disease. If yes, most likely this uh, pericardial effusion is related to his underlying pathology. If no, uh, check if this pericardial effusion is large, more than 20 millimeter. Uh, yes, if yes, consider pericardial synthesis and drainage. If it's coronic, means more than three months. If no, it's a small, you can, uh, or the patient uh, doesn't need uh, intervention, it needs only follow-up. So according to the guidelines, it's recommended to target therapy of pericardial effusion at the etiology, this is class one. Aspirin and safe colchicine treatment of pericarditis recommended when pericardial effusion is associated with systemic inflammation. And uh, this is shown by the increased in inflammatory marker. However, for the pericardial synthesis or cardiac surgery, it's indicated for cardiac tamponade or for symptomatic moderate to large pericardial effusion, not response to the medical therapy and for suspicion of unknown bacterial or neoplastic etiology. So for cardiac tamponade, the causes of uh, cardiac tamponade most commonly is the pericarditis, pericarditis, TP, could be iatrogenic or post-cardiac surgery, trauma or malignancy. There is uncommon causes such as uh, bacterial infection, uremia, and acute and chronic uh, renal failure. So for the diagnosis of the cardiac tamponade, it's mainly clinical diagnosis and echo. You will have, this is considered as emergency and you will have the triad of hypotension, regular venous distension and muffled heart sound, which is the big triad. And on ECG, you will have reduced voltage and electrical alternance as it's shown in the picture. Ecoscience of the cardiac tamponade is large pericardial effusion, which is the most common finding, and swinging motion, and you may have respiratory changes in transmitral and transaortic flow. So for cardiac tamponade, vasodilators and diuretics are not recommended in the presence of cardiac tamponade and you may go for pericardiosynthesis, and the picture is showing the different approaches as subsepoid, apical, and parasternal. Coming to the constrictive pericarditis, I, uh, we have discussed the pathogenesis of the constrictive pericarditis at the beginning. So for the etiology, as idiopathic or viral is the most common, then it's followed by the cardiac surgery. Another cause is the radiation. Also the connective tissue disorder. Infection as the TB or virulent uh, pericarditis is the least causing uh, etiology by three to six percent. This is a study titled as risk of constrictive pericarditis after acute pericarditis by Massimo and his colleagues. And they have done this study in around 500 patients with mean follow-up uh, for 72 months. They found constrictive pericarditis in around one point as a cause was the idiopathic and viral 0.84%. Non-viral, non-idiopathic was the rest by 8.3%. So the symptoms for constrictive pericarditis mainly is the right heart failure, uh, there is no pulmonary uh, congestion, and you usually have no, you will see normal heart size. 
patient complaining of fatigability, this is related to the decrease in output uh, and response to exertion. So pericardial constriction should be considered in any patient with unexplained elevation of jugular venous pressure, particularly with history of cardiac surgery, radiation therapy, or bacterial pericarditis. A subcategory of constrictive pericarditis called transient uh, constrictive pericarditis, it occurs in around 10 to 20% of cases. This is during resolution of pericardial inflammation. And patients with newly diagnosed constrictive pericarditis who are hemodynamically stable, they can be managed conservatively for two to three months with uh, anti-inflammatory anti therapy before pericardectomy is recommended. Other subcategory is the effusive of constrictive pericarditis, which is in 8% of patients with cardiac tamponade who underwent pericardiosynthesis and cardiac catheterization. And the uh, character, characteristic uh, of uh, diagnosis is the failure of right atrial pressure to fall by 50% to the level below 10 millimercury after pericardiosynthesis. And usually these patients present with signs of pericardial effusion or uh, constrictive pericarditis or both. So for the treatment for transient constrictive pericarditis, you will start two to three months course of empiric anti-inflammatory medical therapy for the effusive pericardiosynthesis followed by medical therapy. And you may go for the surgery for pers persistent cases. And the chronic one, pericardiectomy, medical therapy for advanced cases or high risk of surgery, or mixed form with myocardial uh, involvement. This is another study titled as Long-Term Outcomes of Pericardiectomy for Constrictive Pericarditis. And they conclude that cases with new plastic diseases, diminished cardiac output, cases in need for uh, or of uh, reoperation are expected to have high mortality rates and less chance of functional recovery. This slide summarizes uh, the whole topic of uh, pericardial diseases. I hope it was clear and thank you for listening. Uh, Dr. Ibrahim, any comment? Yes, um, very, very nice, uh, very nice presentation. Um, covered a lot of topics um, like your predecessor uh, on uh, pericardial diseases and uh, some of the manifestations of, of, of pericardial diseases. Um, I, I, I had, I think, just one, one comment, maybe a question to the group. Um, the diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. Constrictive pericarditis can be a, you know, in general can be a challenging diagnosis, but, uh, and this is open to, you know, all of the rest, anyone can answer. Um, what are characteristic signs or, or findings or modalities, I would say, one would use to try to pinpoint the diagnosis of constrictive uh, pericarditis. And maybe I'll refine the question a little bit more. Uh, we didn't talk so much about this, um, uh, but there's also restrictive disease. So how would you uh, be able to maybe differentiate between those. Maybe we'll start with uh, um, Abdullah, Abdullah Al-Hudayb. Yes, uh, and cardiac cath uh, usually uh, uh, equalization of uh, chambers uh, pressure, uh, all chambers uh, 
uh, pressure and uh, elevated in diastolic pressure. Uh, and uh, uh, um, you get that uh, ventricular, uh, uh, that, what do you call it, square root sign. Square root uh, sign. In, yeah, in the ventricular pressure. Yes, very the good. Cardiac. Yes, yes, correct. And that, that's something that you, uh, again, I think that's sort of, uh, uh, yeah, so you're alluding to a cardiac cath is what you're talking about, right? Yes, correct. And you're saying equalization of, of pressures in, uh, all, uh, what, when you're saying equalization of pressures in all the chambers, you're meaning what? Which chambers and which pressures, again, just to repeat for the sake of the group. Uh, diastolic uh, pressures, we see right and left. Yes, correct. The right and left diastolic pressures. Um, the, is, is there a way to share the screen? Can uh, someone, uh, can I do that or not? Yeah, can yeah sure. Yes, that's how you can. can. I'm not sure how to, I, uh, I'm not as savvy Chris as on the on the share uh, content, uh -huh. the green one. Okay, and then screen. And yeah, the screen, screen and you can choose whatever you want from your desktop. And I say start broadcast. Okay. Uh, yeah, yes, because it's from okay. your phone. Okay, let me see. Yeah. Um, yes, I, doctor, we can see uh, yours. Your okay, let me see if I have this here. Um, yeah, okay, this is what I was going to show. I don't know if you can see, can you see my cursor, this little white yeah, thing, the yeah. the great thing. Yes. So this is, this is from the Sabiston textbook and they show what the square root sign uh, looks like. So you have, uh, so one thing that, that uh, Abdullah mentioned was the, was the uh, equalization of diastolic pressures on the left and the right side. So you can see the diastolic pressure where my circle is. Um, that's you know the, the lower tracing. These are the systolic pressures over here. So you, you see the difference between the right, I'm assuming this is the right ventricle in green and the left ventricle in yellow. So you can see the difference in the systolic, but the diastolic tracings are equalized. So that's something that's characteristic of, of uh, constrictive pericarditis. The other thing that you see is that what you what you're seeing is a square root sign. See the way I'm doing this. This sign that you see in the arrow. Uh, so, uh, are you all following? Yes. Yeah, yeah, this is what yes. following. Yeah. yeah. So this, this is the, the, the one you are pointing to the square root sign. You mean? Yes. Sort of the yeah. sort of that square root sign that you're seeing is also characteristic. Now, now. I'll ask a little bit more of a question. This is probably more the cardiologist would know this, but suppose you're not seeing that that square root sign. You're 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 suspicious that this is constrictive pericarditis. Um, you've done an echo and you've seen the thickening of the pericardium. Maybe you've seen a little bit of an effusion. Um, you may have even done an MRI and that showed maybe, or a CT scan that showed maybe at least a three to 10 millimeter thickening of the, uh, of the pericardium. Um, what can you do in the cath lab to try to elicit um, this type of a, a tracing or a square root sign? So I'll, uh, you know, in the interest of time, anyone to want to take a guess? Probably inject. Uh, you're, up. Um, you're, you're on the right track. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Probably just to give uh, a bolus. volume or yes, bolus. Correct. Yeah. Bolus. And typically for the adults, they say anywhere from 500 cc's approximately 500 cc's in an adult uh, who can handle that bolus, obviously. 
uh, you it, it 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 will theoretically it'll, it'll start showing you this this type of a this type of a tracing. Um, so yes, I think this is something that uh, you know it's, this might be a question that could appear on a board exam. Um, you know, it's it's fair game for us when we were training. You know, no, but uh, I'm you know I'm, I'm you know it can possibly also appear on your boards as well. So it's something just to keep in mind. All right, good. Any uh, any questions from the group? Uh, so well, very nice. Go ahead. Thank you, doctor. But I have a slide I can share it regarding this sure. comparison between yeah, constrictive and restrictive. Okay. Uh, sure. Let me uh, unshare. Okay. This is the one. Uh, I hope it's clear. Yes. yes. So, yes, as doctor already mentioned regarding the cardiac cath, the square root sign, you can see this in constrictive, while restrictive, there is a marked right ventricular systolic <coughs> hypertension. Uh, also the physical finding comparing both uh, types, the ECG, uh, the echo, uh, also the chest X-ray, it may show in constrictive pericardiac calcification while no calcification in restrictive CT MRI, the CT MRI will show uh, pericardial thickness more than three to four millimeter in the constrictive, uh, while it's less than three in restrictive. So I hope this is will make it more clear. Even Dr. Abdullah, mashallah, he explained it very well. Oh, mashallah, yeah, this, this is this is this is also very good, uh, a very good table to just be, just be aware of, and. Uh, I think especially, you know, the um, the row where they talk, the cardiac catheterization, if there's anything in this table where something might appear on an exam, it might be that row with the cardiac catheter, catheterization uh, component. So, good. Thank you, sir, for this very nice presentation. Thank you for uh, the explanations and the uh, uh, supervision of this uh, um, session today. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Lawan will not be able to join today for the third lecture as he joined uh, a uh, joined a uh, um, emergency case at the uh, uh, so he will not be able to give the lecture. So thank you, everyone. We'll conclude our session for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Shukran, Dr. Abdullah. Jazakallah khair. No, you're welcome. Thank you. Very nice work, uh, both uh, you and Dr. Abdullah. Thank you.